<clears throat> All right, so ingestive behavior. Sounds thrilling, right? It's be a lot of fun. Uh, what are some of the things we're going to talk about? We'll talk about uh, drinking. Uh, that's going to be related to water, just as a heads up, so don't get too excited. Uh, for those of you who thought it was about orange juice, I don't know. Nobody gets excited about orange juice these days. It's fine. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about eating. We're going to skip a good bit of things that I think may or may not be important to you, uh, especially things related to some of the biochemical processes. I think some of you already know those, and the rest of you don't care. So I think that's, that's probably a fair estimate, right? Uh, we'll touch on what you need to know, Emily, and then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about obesity and eating disorders as well. Uh, not a whole lot of time there, but we will talk about some brain mechanisms. It's going to be exciting. Some cool stuff goes on. All right, so uh, when we talk about ingestive behavior, we're really thinking about eating or drinking, right? So that's the, uh, that's the behavior we're going to discuss. Typically, we don't think about ingestive uh, actions as a behavior, right? I mean, how many of you think about eating or drinking uh, water as a behavioral uh, endeavor, right? You don't typically think about that, but we do spend a lot of time doing it. We're not unique in that regard. Uh, most other animals spend a lot of time eating and drinking as well, right? And so a number of, uh, of our activities are generated or are directed toward that. There's sort of an important concept that we want to think about here, and that's homeostasis. We've talked about this before uh, when we talked about like tolerance mechanisms. We've talked about some other things where homeostasis is important to us. The idea here is that your body has various processes and things that are happening. You have a lot of substances that you have to have in, uh, in your body at any time. Right? We're thinking about nutrients, various molecules. Uh, on top of that, there are certain sort of operating conditions, right? So temperature, glucose levels, blood pH, for example, these need to be maintained in sort of these tight parameters in order for all of the uh, sort of chemical reactions in your body to proceed at an acceptable rate that keeps you alive and moving forward, okay? So we want to maintain that through this process of homeostasis. To do this, we're going to sort of have these, uh, what we call these feedback mechanisms or feedback loops, right? And there are two kinds of feedback loops. There are positive feedback loops and negative feedback loops. There is only one example in your body of a positive feedback loop, and that's a good thing. Yeah, that's birth, and we've talked about that a little bit. We're going to contrast that with this negative feedback loop mechanism that we use for every other process. So when we want to think about these regulatory mechanisms, these feedback loops, we really want to focus on sort of four components. Okay? The first is going to be the system variable. And that sounds very complicated. But in fact, it's really just are we monitoring blood glucose? Are we monitoring body temperature? Are we monitoring uh, blood pH? Whatever it is, what is, the, uh, what is that variable? We have to decide or, uh, you know, sometimes the decision is made for us based on sort of physical properties. What is that set point? What is that desirable point? That specific value that is going to allow us to operate at optimal uh, conditions, right? And so you can start to think about this. Uh, how many of you have a thermostat at home? That's that thing you slide that changes the temperature in your house. How many have one of those? There you go, right? Some people didn't know what that was called. So that system variable is going to be temperature. The set point, that's wherever you decide to put that, right? Some people put it on like 68. Some people put it on like 74. Uh, you kind of go somewhere in the middle. Whatever it is, that's going to be your uh, set point. Next, we have to have a detector. We have to have a mechanism that's going to tell us what is the current temperature, right? Is the current temperature in this example at our set point? If that's the case, then it's awesome. If it's not, we need to know that so that we can then engage the correctional mechanism, right? And so following this sort of thermostat example, if you've decided that your ideal temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 
okay? And it suddenly becomes 68 degrees in your home. A correctional mechanism called the furnace, right, or your heater will engage and it will continue to eject hot air. Sounds like a fun thing. Uh, until your temperature in that uh, house goes back up to 70 degrees and then we can turn off that correctional mechanism. Okay? We call this a negative feedback loop because if we become too cold, the sort of adjustment to this robin is to, to add heat, right? So we're moving the opposite direction, so it's negative. Uh, if you become cold, you don't become more cold, right? So if your set point is 70 degrees, and then you measure the temperature in the room at 68, you're not going to go, you know what would really help this? If I turn on the air conditioner and I make it 66 degrees, that'll get me closer to 70 degrees, right? No, that's completely wrong, right? So you're not gonna keep making it colder, or the other way, you're not gonna keep making it hot, right? So you're gonna try to move in that negative direction back toward that original set point. Now that's, uh, we can contrast that with the positive feedback uh, during childbirth, remember we talked about the uh, sort of outpouring of oxytocin to increase the strength of those uterine contractions, right? The point of that was, though, to expel something from your uterus. That's going to be, hopefully, a time-limited event, right? I mean, average childbirth labor probably is 72 hours, right? Is that, that's probably right, right, Eric? I mean, something like that. Uh, you think it's a little less, more like 68? Eight's a long day. Eight's a long day, yeah. Uh, eight hours, that still sounds like a long time, right? To be trying to push something out of your uterus, spending eight hours doing that at one, one sitting. Because I don't think, yeah, right, you can't do it in pieces, right? You can't do like, I'm going to put about a half hour into labor today, come back to this tomorrow. Uh, just like spread it out over the week. It doesn't work that way. You got to do all eight hours at once. You really got to you got to schedule your day around that. I mean, you got to think about all that stuff. you got to clear off your schedule. It just seems like a hassle. All right, so that's a uh, negative feedback versus positive feedback. We talked about that. What's sort of interesting when it comes to ingestive behavior are these satiety mechanisms. And this is kind of cool stuff. How many of you have ever been thirsty? Has that ever happened to anybody? No, never, Alex, you've never been thirsty in your entire life, right? You're just like constantly ingesting water so that doesn't happen. That's fine. That's the smart way to do it. Um, for those of you that have experienced thirst, right, you started drinking some water, and then at some point you stopped drinking water, right? Okay. Now, why were you thirsty? We're going to talk about this in a few moments. The reason you were thirsty is some of your cells needed water. They were short on water, right? And so just keep that in mind. And let's imagine that cell was in your foot. Okay, you guys know where your foot is located relative to your mouth, right? And your stomach. Some people, Eric, make their mouths and feet a lot closer than they should. Uh, and that happens from time to time. So you're going to keep drinking water for some short period of time, right? And then your thirst is going to dissipate. Now, does that mean that you've actually solved the problem? If the problem was that your cells in the distal part of your body were short on water, do you think that your ingesting water has solved that problem? It's probably not, right? Because how long does it take water to go from your stomach to your arms or your legs? That's like some period of time, right? I mean, there's, there's absorption, there's this delivery time, right? This takes some time. The problem is, if you were to continue to drink water continuously until that water was delivered to the most distant part of your body, uh, that's a lot of water, right? And that's a lot of extra water that you didn't need. So you have to monitor how much water is coming in, compare that to your need, and once that much water has, has entered your body, Regan, just stop drinking, right? Wait, it's going to be delivered, we're going to be fine, okay? We don't have to keep doing this. Same thing works with, um, you know, nutrients as well, okay? Why are you hungry? You're short on some nutrients, right? So you want to deliver those nutrients to your body. You're going to eat. Eating is going to take a very small period of time. 
relative to how long it takes to deliver those nutrients to the rest of your body, right? You're not going to continue to eat the whole rest of that time, right, Eric? That makes sense. So you want to shut that off. So those are the satiety mechanisms in general. There you go. There's a uh, electrical heater. It's just a diagram showing you how that positive uh, or that negative feedback loop works in this case. Nothing to worry about there. All right. Here are the basics. Uh, this is a basic outline for drinking. You're going to lose water from time to time. This happens. Uh, there are sort of two major exit routes for water from your body. Anybody know what those are? Sweat. Yeah, what's the other one? Breathing. Breathing, yes. Yeah, so, oh, some comes out through breathing. So there's sort of a third one. Um, I was thinking urine was another fun way to get rid of bodily fluids. Um, especially if there's like snow and you write your name out there. Nobody was, for some of you, that's going to be more effort than others. Some of you are going to have to move your feet to make that happen. Uh, and some people are not. And you can think about that and figure out which category you're in. There's that foot and mouth getting closer, right? I always, always keep it right on the edge. Um, so we're going to detect that we've lost some water. We're going to start drinking some water. Our stomach's going to fill up with water. Wow, that's exciting. Uh, that's going to trigger the satiety mechanism that's going to turn off that behavior of drinking water. That's going to be great. That water in the stomach is going to be absorbed back into our body fluids. It's going to make that normal. We're going to be happy um, and we're going to be full of water. And that's, there you go. Not a bad idea, right? Good thing it works that way. All right. You have a number of different kinds of fluids in your body. I'm not going to expect you to think about these too much. You have some fluid in your cells. You have some fluid in between your cells. You've got some fluid in some other sort of places, right? Like your blood vessels, or your blood vessels, for example. You've got some fluid in there. Plasma. How many of you are familiar with blood plasma? It's just mostly water, right? With some, you know, proteins in there and so forth. Not a big deal. We do have two types of thirst, though. This is sort of interesting. We need to think about this. Okay? We need to think about the different ways that we can uh, create thirst. And we actually have two different monitors on this. Right? So because there are two types of thirst, there are two things we have to keep our eye on. So there are two brain structures that are going to be sampling information related to these two types of thirst. Okay? Now, the end result is going to be the same. That's going to be put more water in your body. Right, Jasmine? So it doesn't matter really which one of these types of thirst you experience, the, the solution is the same. Okay? All right, so we have something called hypovolemia, right? This just means you're losing fluid, uh, intravascular fluid. Now, there are a couple ways you can lose intravascular fluid. Uh, some are, you know, more thrilling than others. Some of those involve, uh, like, chainsaws, for example, right? Um, so if you have, like, a, a massive cut, Right? You're going to start bleeding. That sounds like fun, Travis. Right? Uh, I would avoid that at all costs. Uh, I don't know if any of you juggle chainsaws on the side. A little side gig. Think about it. People pay to watch that. Uh, there are a couple things you can do to sort of uh, you know, stop this flow of blood, this loss of intravascular fluid. One of the things you can do is you can start contracting your muscles in your veins and arteries, trying to make them smaller, reducing the volume for that blood rate because your blood pressure has to be so high. Uh, but that has some very definite limits, right? I don't think you can like, you know, cut a major artery and then imagine like you can just really reduce your uh, vascular volume elsewhere and that's going to really solve that problem for you, right? So you're going to have to do other things. Not a big deal. This is going to... Um, result in volumetric thirst. Right? When we have that intravascular volume uh, decrease, and that's, uh, that's hyper uh, or hypovolemic issue. Now this is going to cause some um, hormones, right, to be released from your kidneys. I don't expect you to think too much about that, okay? But the point of this is that 
angiotensin is going to be a signal for us, right? When we've got this guy circulating, we know we are experiencing volumetric thirst, okay? So we're going to keep our eye on that. The other sort of thirst that we have is the um, osmometric thirst, right? This is related to changes in osmotic pressure between your interstitial fluid and your intracellular fluid, so it's the fluid in the cells and the fluid in between the cells. Okay. Uh, this will cause cellular dehydration, that's what we're looking for there. There are a couple organs, uh, I don't expect you to remember the long name here, but I do want you to think about this OVLT, right, that this guy is sort of important. So there we go, we've thought about our, our sort of two types of thirst, right? And there we go, there's some water loss through evaporation, uh, not a big deal. We're looking at osmometric thirst here, so you can see what's going on. There are some brain uh, regions that are active, for example, an osmometric thirst. In particular, we've got activation in the, what we call the anterior cingulate cortex. Right, it's going to kind of be here, uh, and that's going to let us know that we're experiencing that particular kind of thirst. So you can do this. You can put people in an fMRI machine, I guess, and then um, you know try to turn them into beef jerky, dehydrate them over a period of time, and then they'll, they'll tell you they're thirsty. This is actually an important concept. Uh, and that whole sort of two types of thirst business has led up to the idea of circumventricular organs. How many of you recall the blood-brain barrier? Yeah. Michaela, that was the coolest thing ever, right? Um, except those times when it broke down and didn't really help you. But blood-brain barrier keeps stuff from getting into your brain, right, through your blood supply, which is great because it can keep out toxic chemicals and so forth. The problem with that is if we are trying to measure, right, if we are trying to measure either osmometric thirst or volumetric thirst, we actually really need to be able to sample information directly from the blood supply. Okay? We need to be able to have contact between our brain and our blood supply in order for that to work. Right? Does that make sense to everybody? So there are a few places in your brain where the blood-brain barrier is either weak or non-existent. Okay? And two of those places are going to be here uh, in the subfornical organ and in the uh, OVLT. Okay? Both of these guys send information to the median preoptic nucleus, which is then going to trigger that drinking behavior. So both of them are, Robin, they're sending information right into the same place, okay? But they're both measuring different things, and they need to be exposed directly to the blood, so they have that really weak sort of uh, spot there. There's one other sort of fun um, circumventricular organ. It's called the area plastrema. How many of you have ever had projectile vomiting? Nobody's ever had the pleasure of experiencing that? So exciting. Uh, your area postrema is involved in uh, projectile vomiting as well. Quickly, sort of, if there are funky things floating around in your blood, it'll trigger the uh, area postrema to make you vomit because it thinks there's something in you that's going to kill you, and the best way to get that out is by vomiting. So that's exciting, right? Nobody's thrilled by projectile vomiting. I don't know why. I thought that would be a fun topic. Okay, so there you go. Not a big deal. We're going to measure uh, these signals. As we said, for volumetric thirst, that, uh, that hormone, that's a signal for that that's not across the blood-brain barrier. That's why the uh, circumventricular organs are necessary to sample that information. Okay. All of that's going into the median preoptic nucleus. Do not con confuse this with the medial preoptic nucleus. I know they, they sort of sound similar, but if you remember, the medial preoptic nucleus was involved in male sexual behavior. <coughs> They're two different nuclei that produce two different kinds of behavior. Okay. I think this is a really good uh, diagram just to show you what's going on. Volumetric thirst, you've got your subfornical organ there. That's going to monitor that uh, angiotensin II levels. 
your osmometric thirst is going to be monitored by the OVLT, and it's going to look at solute concentration of your blood, right? So it's going to be measuring the uh, solute concentration in your blood plasma as it's flying by. Both of these are on the outside of the blood-brain barrier. So if you look at this um, blood-brain barrier, you can see the median preoptic nucleus is actually protected by that. So it is not exposed to the blood directly, but it's getting the signals from either the subfornical organ or the OVLT. Does that make sense? Awesome. <clears throat> Any questions about drinking before we move on to eating? No? It's not too bad. It's pretty straightforward, right? Really, you need to understand this diagram. If you understand this diagram, you're going to handle, be able to handle just about anything uh, related to drinking. All right, what about eating? Who loves to eat? Nobody's going to answer that, right? Some people might. Uh, you should eat, and you should love to eat, for a couple of reasons. It keeps you alive. How many of you like being alive? Nobody's going to answer that either. <clears throat> Just going to stare at everybody awkwardly until you start answering questions. <laughs> doesn't work, does it? I've tried it. <clears throat> Alright, uh, so we do eat, also when we eat there's some, and we'll talk about this in a moment, there's uh, some actually interesting stuff going on with dopamine release and so forth. Uh, what's actually really cool about eating is it's like you literally are what you eat, uh, right? Like, like very literally you are what you eat. Because the, what you eat, we actually take those molecules of other uh, plant or animals, right, those other living organisms, and we turn those into things inside our body. So we break down whatever elements there are of something that we've eaten, and we use that to build and replace what we have, and then we use you know energy molecules from that as well. Okay, so not a big deal. So we're either going to construct and maintain our own organs, or we're going to need energy uh, for muscular movements and keeping our bodies warm. Most people don't think about like eating to keep yourself warm, right? Except for like there's like a cold day when we eat some soup, that's going to be exciting. Uh, but even on warmer days, you know, your body internal temperature has to be like so high, right? For all of these chemical reactions to occur. And so you have to keep your body temperature up to a certain level as well. All right. So as we all know, our cells need that fuel and they also need oxygen. Uh, guess where that uh, fuel comes from? It comes from your digestive tract. And you put stuff there by eating it. So that's exciting, right? Anybody want to say if they have something in their digestive tract right now? You probably do. If you've eaten in the last 24 hours, there's something in your body somewhere. Some of you might be a little faster than that, but I'm going to say most people aren't. Okay. Ever interested in how fast you are digesting food? It's a great way to do it. It involves what we refer to as marker foods. Don't eat markers, but eat things like corn. Um, and then like write down when you ate that, and then write down when you see it again. And then you'll know exactly how long it takes you to digest food. That's imp it's actually important information. <clears throat> because sometimes you're going to get um, variations in that, right? And those variations can be important for your overall health. Nobody else is taking that seriously. You guys... I worry about you. Nobody takes their vowels seriously these days. It's like this whole book um, called Gulp. You guys know Mary Roach? She's written a number of books. Uh, Gulp, it's all about the digestive tract. She wrote one called Stiff, it's about dead people. Uh, and then she wrote one called Spook. It's kind of like the scientific approach to the afterlife. I don't know. I, I've actually not read any of her books, so I can't tell you how well they're written. But I, I've listened to several of her like, sort of extended interviews uh, on, on the uh, radio and so forth, right? Uh, but when she wrote Gulp, she uh, you know, interviewed uh, a lot of folks who study the digestive system. There's apparently someone out there who studies like flatulence and specific odor. I know, right? And you're like thinking about this for a minute. like. Like, how do you get that job, and how do I avoid it? Uh, and so the way you avoid it, folks, is like study for your exams. Otherwise, you're going to have to become a flashlance tester. 
uh, and you don't want to do that. For those of you that don't know what flash lens is, you're going to end up doing it. So, so look forward to that. Uh, so anyway, they're, they're like different chemical compounds. So you like analyze the odor and like the chemical, like the gaseous compounds. I don't know. It's kind of an interesting. Apparently everybody sort of has their own sort of signature chemical compound for flatulence based on the bacteria that live in your gut and the foods that you eat. Nobody found that as interesting as I did. Or you don't want to admit to it. It's a little odd. Right, Emily? You're just not interested. I don't know. I think about it sometimes. Like You can tell like who's been in your house recently. All right. No worries there. Uh, let's see. Uh, what about reservoirs, right? You store nutrients in your body all the time, right? How many of you are currently eating right now? See, finally I asked the question that everybody could not answer, right? And they can just leave their hands down. Because no one's really eating right now as far as I can tell. Um, how many of you have eaten in the past, right? If you were only able to use the energy that you were obtaining currently from eating, you have to constantly be eating, right? Because as soon as you stopped eating, guess what would happen? You'd die, right? So it doesn't work that way. We were able to eat in a clump. We we're able to store those molecules for long-term use. We we're able to go about our day, right? And so we have these different, what we call, absorptive and uh, fasting stages, right? And just because we're fasting doesn't mean that we're not using nutrients, we clearly are, we're, we're tapping into those, uh, those reservoirs, right? Those either short-term or long-term reservoirs. Hey, how many of you love glucose? Everybody does. Uh, everybody does, we're built this way. You love things that are sweet, right? Because you need glucose for a variety of things. In particular, you need glucose so your brain will work. Um, and this is highly important that your brain works. Now, you're going to eat something, let's think about something full of glucose that you've eaten recently. Uh, how many of you have had a Snickers bar in the last six years? So that's a pretty wide window, right? Nobody eats Snickers bars. We had this, we had this strange conversation with my wife and I last night, and I said something about I don't even remember what I was talking about. And she looks at me and she says, I don't think I've ever seen you eat a Snickers bar. And I said, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I have clearly eaten one in the past. Uh, and she said, I don't think I've ever seen you ever eat a candy bar. And I was like, well, I clearly do eat candy bars from time to time. Like, that's a thing that, that, that I do. Uh, but apparently she's never seen one that I've eaten. So I think I'm going to stop on the way home and just buy like a big box of candy bars and eat them all. Huh? Oh yeah, yeah, one of those giant bars, like, like here's like 10 years worth of candy bars, you can just watch me eat it once. Uh, so glucose is awesome, you need it for your brain to work, okay? Your brain runs exclusively on glucose, it's not going to use anything else, it's only going to use glucose, so we have to get glucose to your brain. What are we going to do with the glucose that's extra, right? Because <clears throat> let's imagine you eat that giant candy bar and you don't need all that glucose right now. Well, we've got a couple awesome uh, things that can happen here. We can actually use insulin to store this guy as uh, glycogen, right? So this is a sort of complex long-term or longer-term storage molecule for glucose so we don't have to use it immediately, right? Later when we want to like, hey, I want to use a little bit of that glucose, uh, we can use some glucagon to kind of chip off pieces, right? And then that glucose becomes available for us to use. <clears throat> How many of you know someone with diabetes? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's, yeah. Diabetes is a pretty prevalent thing, right? Uh, what's, what's the uh, concern with folks with diabetes? They're, what we call their blood sugar is high, right? And so that's the amount of glucose that's in their blood is elevated, right? What's a, what's a molecule you give folks who have uh, diabetes to reduce their blood sugar levels. Insulin. insulin, right? Yeah, so insulin takes that blood sugar, <coughs> the sugar in the blood, and uh, can help you store that as glycogen for those uh, later times. Okay? That's kind of fun, right? Also, the best thing you can do if you have diabetes 
Z cupcakes. No, that's bad advice. Do the opposite of that, right? Try to try to cut back on your sugar intake. You're not doing such a great job of, of getting that out of your blood. Uh, how many of you have ever had a urinalysis? You don't have to tell me why. Right? Uh, <clears throat> I'm assuming a number of you have for job purposes, right? Uh, some of you who are uh, student athletes, have you ever had to have a urinalysis to test for uh, like performance enhancing drugs or anything, right? Okay, so they'll uh, they'll test your urine for that. You should just have one periodically just for your own health, right? What should be in your urine is really only three things. Water, salt, sodium, and uh, urea, which is the uh, sort of the nitrogenous waste, right, that you're creating. It's this byproduct of all the stuff your cells are doing. Um, if you have high blood pressure, for example, there's going to be something else in your blood or in your... Um, urine, occasionally blood, uh, but really we're thinking about proteins, right? So if there's some, uh, you know, some of those blood proteins are in there, then that indicates that your holes are too big in your kidneys and you're blowing out uh, protein, which is a bad thing, because you could go into uh, like acidosis, for example, sort of, you know, eat yourself from the inside out. Uh, the other thing is if you're diabetic, <clears throat> you will have uh, glucose in your urine. Right? Because the whole point of urine is to get like extra stuff out of your body. Okay, so anything that's extra is going to come out through your urine, any little molecules, and uh, sugar will, will come out there way uh, glucose. So here's like a cheap home test for diabetes. Just uh, pee in a cup and drink it, see if it's a little sweet. And if it is, you might be, uh, might be worried about some, some diabetic problems. Nobody's going to try that, are they? It's a little savory, you might have high blood pressure because it's got that extra protein in there. Save your, save your health dollars that way, right? Nobody, nobody drinks their own urine, right? And if you do, you're not going to tell me. I think you're going to keep that to yourself. <clears throat> in a pinch, it'll work, right? But only do it once. I, I mean, you only do it once before you actually drink some water in between, right? And like, because it's going to be like too concentrated the second time through, and it's not going to help you with any kind of dehydration issue. But the first time, first time, you know, if you're like, don't have any water at all, you can drink your urine, and it will, it will bite you all the time. <clears throat> just, just a little survival tip there. <clears throat> you know, like the next time the water goes out in this state, where you find yourself stranded in a desert. One of those is more likely than the other. All right, uh, <clears throat> what do I want you to know about uh, triglycerides? Not much, <clears throat> right? It's a form of sort of, uh, it's a long-term reservoir, not a big deal. Um, <clears throat> one reason that fatty foods are so uh, attractive, right, is because fats have sort of, you know, there's always just like, there's more energy, Per gram in fats than in other sort of um, sort of food sources, right? And so, if the whole point is getting energy, you want that most efficient form. This made a lot more sense when you were like just like chasing down a rabbit and you had to grab it and like you know eat it that way. Uh, now that you can just go to your refrigerator and pull out a turkey sandwich, um, you know you can sort of. It's hard though, right? Because you're you're. For millennia, you have been wired to eat the sweetest, most fattening product possible, right? That food, because that's going to be what helps you. You don't know when your next meal is going to arrive. I'm not trying to make light of anybody, because there are a number of individuals who are dealing with sort of food insecurity, right? And unfortunately, it, it strikes um, college students quite a bit more than, than you guys are willing to admit. So this is a great time for me to put a plug in for the food pantry. I wish I knew where it was, then make this plug more effective. Right, Olivia, but I don't. Uh, so, so, we do have a food pantry. I believe it's at a Presbyterian church. That's, that's my assumption. That may be incorrect. You could look it up online, um, and you can go get food there, and they'll, they'll help you out. It used to be here on campus, and then some real idiot decided uh, to rearrange a bunch of things over in the student center, and our food pantry lost its space. Thankfully, there was, uh, you know, like a local 
institution who is willing to, to allow it to be moved to their facility. So, <clears throat> so there you go. Anybody know where it is exactly? Because I, I know there are a lot of like student volunteers. One of you may volunteer there uh, to help organize and donate things. No? That's fine. All right, we've already talked about fasting phases versus absorptive phases, right? Uh, guess what you're doing during the absorptive phase? You are absorbing nutrients from your digestive, di digestive tract. Shouldn't be a shock. Fasting phase, uh, any of the nutrients that you're using are ones that are not in your digestive system. They're ones that you've put into that long-term storage banks, okay? This is a pretty awesome diagram. Uh, letting you know where food goes when you eat it and what it does, right? If you look at your brain and you see there's only a blue arrow, that means only glucose is going to supply your brain uh, with its energy, right? And then down here it's the other as well. We can store this as glycogen in your liver or uh, we can store it as triglycerides in adipose tissue, right? So we're going to store things and then we can break it down and we can use that later. Questions about that? <clears throat> That's all pretty straightforward. I think some of you probably have already had some deeper knowledge about that. Right? If you've taken a physiology course, you've probably covered that in more detail. Uh, if you haven't, and you're just, a, how many of you are psych majors? Yeah, I mean, you probably don't care, right? It's like, well, whatever. But what is interesting about this now is, is what's next, right? And these are sort of the brain mechanisms that are actually going to uh, signal this process, right? So how do you know you're hungry? How do you know that you need to eat? How do you know you're no longer hungry, right? <clears throat> so here's a great one. Uh, signals to start a meal. So what starts a meal? I always like to say appetizers. Um, nobody thought that was a good joke. I worked on that too for hours. No, no. Where is everybody today? You're here. Uh, just physically though. Outside, yeah, it'll still be daylight when class is over. And guess how many weeks we have left? We only have eight weeks left in this class. Elizabeth, I think it's like four, right? Uh, it probably feels like eight. And then you have like the whole summer to never see me again, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. Whether or not you are, I don't know. So there's this guy called Ghrelin, right? This is released by the stomach, and it's going to increase eating. Some of it's also produced by neurons in the brain. Okay. Ghrelin comes out of your stomach and gets into your blood supply. It goes into your hypothalamus. Remember that hypothalamus guy does a lot, especially with hormones, right? Controls a lot of your behavior. Here's what's kind of cool. You can track ghrelin levels, right, in your blood plasma over time. And what you see is actually <coughs> sort of a spike in ghrelin levels, and then you, you know, each dotted line represents a meal. So then you see a drop in ghrelin for a while, and then a spike again, and a drop, spike, drop. And what I think is interesting is kind of that creeping up of ghrelin um, late in the evening, right? So I think this is uh, one thing that makes weight management difficult. Uh, how, many, how many of you have heard the, this advice is out there all the time, like don't eat too late at night? All right, they tell you that's a great way to, to manage your weight, don't eat way late, which is great advice, I suppose, right? It's whatever, it seems reasonable. Uh, the problem with that is this ghrelin level keeps going up and you're going to feel hungry. How many of you have ever gone to bed hungry? It's not a lot of fun, is it? I, Celine, I can see your, your face was like this. Like you, and, and it was just, I could tell, like it was, it's not a pleasant experience going to bed hungry, right? You try it, and then about two days later, you're like, hostess cupcakes. Um, because that's about how long I think most of you have willpower is two days. Right? And then you break down, you're like, what can I actually eat? And you're just like, you know, it's like one of those meals, I think this is that meal that people have that it's like, I don't know, like two slices of cheese, some blueberries, piece of bread um, and like a taco shell and it's like those are just like the five things I could find in my house that I didn't have to cook and I'm hungry so I'm going to eat those right now how many of you have ever eaten one of those meals 
Yeah, it happens all the time, right? Yeah. And then you try to think of like creative ways you can put it together so it doesn't taste that bad. It just happens. Uh, but this is ghrelin. So ghrelin goes up and down, up and down, kind of follows, uh, you know, spikes throughout the day when you would, would normally eat, right? This is what you do. Uh, and then after you eat, it drops. So that's not too big of a deal. Uh, there are some other signals, some metabolic signals, right? If you're getting low on glucose or fats, then that's definitely going to say, hey, you should probably eat something, right? Okay? That makes sense, right? I mean, if you're running low on nutrients, your brain should say to you, hey, um, have you considered, you know, like a meal? That's kind of a thing you should do. Okay, so you have to eat from time to time. Uh, in your liver, your liver plays a big role in this. There are glucose detectors and lipid detectors, right? So they're constantly monitoring glucose and lipid le uh, levels, right? And when those get too low, you can start to trigger, um, trigger eating. Here's a real shocker. Nobody has ever thought of this. Uh, to regulate your body weight, you should balance your food intake with your energy expenditure. I know, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's such a revolutionary idea. I'm going to give you a moment to let that sink in. If you expend as many calories as you ingest, your body weight will stay the same. If you want to increase your weight, then increase your food intake relative to your calorie expenditure. Um, if you want to lose weight, then increase your calorie expenditure relative to your calorie intake, right? So that sounds like fun. All right, so don't worry about too much of the rest of this. We should think, though, about food a little bit and what are some signals that we get from sensory factors that might... Uh, trigger us to eat, right? Anybody hungry right now? Yeah. I would love to give this lecture and like, have like a, like off into the, like on the other room, I have like a vent, I have like a pizza oven with a fan, like blowing pizza fumes in uh, to try to, try to get people stirred up, right? How many of you think that would make you hungry? How many of you have not been hungry sometime and then you go somewhere and all of a sudden you see or smell food and you're like, man, I have to eat now, right? It happens to everybody. It's a good thing it happens to you. I mean, like in the terms of survival of our species because let's go back a couple millennia and you were just like walking around and you weren't very hungry. And all of a sudden there was like a nice like apple just hanging there for you, Regan. Uh, and you think, you know, I'm gonna pass on that. I mean, there, there may not be another apple. Pull that apple down and eat it. You don't know when you're getting your next one, right? So you go meet some friends at Fat Patties for five minutes and you're not hungry. The next thing you know, you're sitting down to a big cheeseburger uh, and you're like, why am I doing this? And you're like, well, evolution. Just blame it on evolution. That's what I do. So there you go. Oh, I will say sometimes if you walk around the back of Fat Patties, it'll make you not hungry. So, <laughs> right, man. so always make a lap around the back side of the building first before you go in, because it will turn your appetite the other direction. Then you talk about that projectile vomiting. Because for some reason, there's like a funky odor comes out of that building. I think a funky odor comes out of most restaurants in the back. So that's, that's always something to think about. I'm just giving you these great tips, right, life lessons. Uh, here are a couple of other molecules to think about, CCK and uh, peptide YY. Both of these uh, promote society, satiety. Um, they come from different parts of the intestine. Okay. <laughs> CCK in particular is secreted uh, in response to the presence of fats. Uh, PYY is just nutrients in general. Now, talked about a lot of these satiety signals, right? No worries, there's this 
great, phenomenal picture. I don't, I don't know what the, this guy's like too happy to be eating this sandwich. And he has poor sandwich eating skills. I think he's going to bite a finger. Uh, if you take a look at that, that's not how you hold a sandwich if you're going to eat it. Just want to let you guys know. Uh, fingers away from the mouth. Just as a heads up. Nobody eats a sandwich like this. <coughs> poor form. Uh, so here we go. So here's some folks uh, where they gave individuals a dose of PYY or saline. You actually see a reduction in caloric intake with uh, you know that peptide YY. Okay, and this is these each of these lines represents a different person. But what you see for each person is you see a reduction in caloric intake uh, from control or you know the saline sham sort of dosage versus the, um, the injection of peptide YY. So there you go. I mean, I mean it has a direct effect on the caloric intake. Uh, what stops a meal? If appetizer started, it's always the check that stops it. Uh, right? Because when that shows up, you're like, time to leave. How many of you have ever run out without paying a bill? Regan? I, no. That seemed like, no, you've thought about it though, right? You have friends who've done it. I don't know. It happens. Don't worry about it. Uh, the last stage of satiety is going to occur in the liver. Why the liver? The liver is really the first organ to know you have successfully absorbed nutrients. Okay? We don't want to wait until it goes to every other organ. Right? If you had to wait until all the other organs were like, yeah, we got some nutrients, great, I'm excited about this. Uh, that could take forever, right? And satiety would never kick in. Okay, so we want to get that first guy. That first guy is the liver, right? Unless it's that first organ to go, yes, nutrients successfully delivered, process complete, you can stop eating. Okay? Not a big deal. Uh, what about insulin? Insulin's kind of cool because it lets your brain know that you're in the absorptive phase, right? Because why would you want insulin during the absorptive phase? Because if you're absorbing nutrients, guess what happens? They're going to be in your blood. If glucose is in your blood, what do you need to do with it? Turn it into glycogen. You're going to do that using insulin. So insulin's going to be present in your blood. So that says, hey, you're in the absorptive phase. Good to go. All right. In case you were not aware, obesity is a major health concern, right? Uh, in fact, it's a major health concern here in West Virginia. It's a major health concern nationwide. We have seen over the last several years an increase in uh, obesity across the population. In particular, childhood obesity is of uh, considerable concern, right? maybe more so than in some other stages. Uh, what's interesting, Eric, and we talked about this in my other class, was the effects of uh, high-fat diets on brain circuits, right? And the fact that there's some evidence out there right now that indicates that if you, uh, your mother, while she was pregnant with you, ingested a high-fat diet, your brain, and this happens at least in rats, and so we're going to assume it can happen in humans too, your brain is actually going to be uh, altered a bit so that your neural circuits are more likely to respond uh, as if you were uh, addicted to a drug, for example. Right? And so it's really going to mess up some of that. Uh, neural circuitry involved in like reward mechanisms, which is going to be kind of kind of an interesting thing to think about. Okay. So they have created these mice called OB mice. Uh, they are obese and they have a low metabolic rate. Right? And in particular, this has been because of a mutation of leptin. Leptin is a hormone is secreted by adipose tissue. So if you have uh, an uptick in adipose tissue, you're going to have an uptick in leptin, and that uh, leptin is actually going to lead to a decrease in food intake. That makes sense, right? If you are consuming enough extra calories to create some adipose tissue, then bingo, you don't have to eat anymore, right? You're good to go. You've got some long-term storage. You're going to be fine. Okay. Uh, don't worry about the effects of force feeding. That's not a big deal. This is the OB mouse. In case you wanted to see an image of that, and this is sort of a regular mouse. Kind of tell there's a difference. And again, it's because of the uh, the screwed up leptin signaling in the OB mouse. 
Ray? I was just saying it's a leptin that's associated with energy expenditure. Uh, it's, it's associated with adipose tissue. So the more adipose tissue you have, the more leptin you will have, right? And so leptin is going to be a signal for you to decrease uh, food intake, caloric intake, right? And so if you're at the point where you're able to make adipose tissue, right, that's a long-term storage molecule. So you've ingested enough food for your immediate needs and you're banking some for long-term needs. So leptin's going to kick in and say, you can stop eating that, okay? We've got long-term energy stores we can pull from that. When you lose that adipose tissue, your leptin amounts go down and then that would increase food intake again. Does that make sense? You no, know, just figuring out why it increases the metabolic rate. I think it's such an energy expenditure. Yeah. So, so what do you mean? I'll just talk to you afterwards. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, so, so you want to increase. Uh, I see what you're asking here, yeah. Uh, so if you're increasing your metabolic rate, that's so you can uh, use those long-term energy stores, right? So the point is, because leptin is related to adipose tissue, uh, you know, so you don't want a massive buildup of adipose tissue, right? And there are two ways to reduce adipose tissue. One of those is going to be to decrease your food intake, and the flip side of that is going to be to increase your, uh, your energy expenditure, as you said, your activity rate, right? So if you increase that metabolic rate, if you start trying to burn up some of those uh, resources that you've stored, then you can maintain that healthy balance, right, of adipose tissue. You can kind of keep it at, a, at an acceptable level. Okay. Um, don't worry too much about this, uh, but if you do um, sort of cut off the brain stem from the forebrain, right? So the hindbrain disconnect that from the forebrain. Uh, you can you can have some uh, some interesting sort of effects. We do want to talk about the hypothalamus when it comes to brain damage um, and eating. If you destroy the lateral hypothalamus, animals will stop eating or drinking, right? So they, if you destroy that lateral hypothalamus, they will um, feel like they're always uh, as satiety, right? So they're always sated, so they're not going to have that. If you stimulate that same region, it's actually going to produce eating and drinking, right? So they kind of have, if it's activated, it's going to produce eating. If it is not activated, then it's going to decrease that uh, eating and drinking behavior. Sort of the opposite happens for the ventromedial uh, hypothalamus. If you destroy that, then you're going to have overeating. If you stimulate it, you're going to suppress your eating. So the lateral hypothalamus and the ventromedial hypothalamus have sort of two opposing jobs, right? If one's activated, it's going to stimulate eating. If the other one's activated, it's going to decrease eating. I don't expect you to remember which is which, but I want you to think that the hypothalamus actually, like I want you to realize it's actually a bunch of individual nuclei that are working in different directions sometimes. It's not just like one big lump of a nucleus. Right? And as you can see, this is sort of the hypothalamus here. And all of those different colored spots represent different nuclei in the hypothalamus. Don't worry too much about this. It's like this really weird story with uh, melanin concentrating hormone uh, and, and eating, so don't worry about it. <laughs> it's like really hot in here. Anybody else agree with Okay, so it's not just me. Um, I thought I broke the thermostat on this one so it was permanently cold, but I think that was the other room. Uh, but you're welcome to turn that all the way down to 68 degrees, as low as it will go, I know that. But it should be there. I doubt it's helping. All right, don't worry about this uh, slide or that slide. We've already talked about leptin, so that's not a big deal. It's rolling so tight. Um, we should talk briefly about obesity before we move on to something else. There are a number of factors that uh, possibly uh, contribute to obesity rates. There are environmental factors, uh, physical activity factors, right? Most people do not have uh, jobs that require them to be as physically active. Uh, today is sort of at any time in the past, right? 
So that, that uh, plays a role. There are genetic factors, but mostly only in extreme cases. There's this wonderful BMI score thing. Anybody ever use these BMI scores? Yeah, they're, they're not, they work for like a, I mean, if you're like between the ages of, you know, like 27 and 28, and you only run more than one mile per week, but not more than two, um, and you eat carrots, but not celery, it works for you, right? There are all these like restrictions on BMI, right? So don't like go look at these BMIs and go like, wow, I'm really like one place or the other, right? So I'm gonna take a guess that there are a number of you sort of in this category that probably would not consider yourselves overweight or obese that you might fall down in kind of that normal range, right? Eric, are you in one of those? Yeah, it says like I'm a little overweight, but I thought that can't be. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean that happens. Yeah. Um, so these these are you know they kind of work, but not always. Uh, we already know about that. Uh, what's kind of the some of the environmental factors? For most of us, food is fairly inexpensive and it's fairly convenient, right? How many of you think within ten minutes of right now? you could be eating uh, a meal. It could probably happen, right? I mean, it's not that far for you to like walk over to the student center, restaurants are fairly close, there are vending machines, right? So food is fairly convenient. Um, it's also, how many of you eat things that come out of packages? Every, everybody eats things that come out of packages, right? Uh, that, that's a relatively recent sort of development as packaged foods, right? Uh, foods, you know, let's go back 100 years, didn't really come in packages. I mean, you had canning, right? But you didn't have like foil packs maybe a couple hundred years ago. Uh, how many of you have eaten a protein bar? Yeah, Ray, so you eat a protein bar, that comes in a package, right? Uh, think about how long did it, what's the expiration date on that? It's like two years from now. You've got one right now, <laughs> he's gonna check. Uh, but the expiration date on that is like some extended period of time, right? If you lived 200 years ago and you were trying to eat something, the expiration date on that was probably yesterday. Uh, and you're, you're, you're going to eat it today because that's what you have, right? So the preservatives and things that's made a big difference for us. Difference for us. Things are palatable. Uh, they're high calorie. We can pack a lot into. You look at those little protein bars. Some of those have you know 300 calories in them, right? So you can really pack a lot in there. Uh, snack foods. How many of you love snack foods? Everybody does. It's part of the convenience thing, right? How many of you love Capri Suns? Nobody? Somebody does. I know. Right there you go, Emily. Thank you so much. Uh, I actually, so there's like this book about like sort of like snack foods and these convenience foods that really kind of exploded back in the 1980s. Uh, and in the 1980s, you sort of saw an uptick in um, um, multiple earner households, right? So you no longer, single earner house, households were no longer sort of the predominant situation. So most people were growing up in homes where both parents worked and their parents were looking for faster, easier ways to feed their kids. And so these snack foods kind of came along at that time and people were really like, yeah, that's awesome. Lunchables, how many of you know Lunchables? Yeah, yeah those, were, those were a product of that time, right? Um, and so, not so good, right? Uh, but those are okay, like once in a while, I like to have a Capri Sun like once a week, that's probably awesome. Uh, but to go like sit down at your meal and have like four of them, that's how many it takes to drink because they're like these little small pouches, right? Uh, that's probably not the best approach. All right, we've already talked about this. Uh, energy expenditure business, not a big deal. Genetic factors contribute a bit, but not a whole lot. It's difficult to treat obesity um, for a lot of reasons. I mean, you might think like, hey, why don't we just give people a shot of uh, CCK or neuropeptide Y, you know, MPY or MP or PYY or these other hormones, right? Uh, why don't we block production of ghrelin? Well, that, this doesn't seem to work, right? Humans are very complicated. We've got a lot of complicated mechanisms. You would imagine, Colin, that something as important as eating should have backup mechanisms, right? Because if, if, if you only had one mechanism to control your eating and it went out, guess what? You're going to be dead pretty soon, right? So you want to have a lot of backup systems. You want to have redundancy in place, right? So there are multiple factors that control and contribute to ingested behavior. And that, that's, that's smart from that perspective, right? Uh, some folks think of overeating as a form of addiction. I think that's really interesting, especially in light of the 
evidence that we just talked about with the um, you know high fat diets altering the structure of your brain, especially in those circuits that control addictive behaviors. There's gastric bypass. We don't think about that too much. Of course, there are pharmacological behavioral interventions as well. We should briefly talk about eating disorders. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. The main thing I want to say is if you're dealing with an eating disorder, please uh, get some help for that, right? Uh, that's something that a lot of folks don't, don't get help for for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, so if you or someone you know is dealing with an eating disorder, we do have uh, places here on campus that can help you for no cost, right? Uh, I recommend starting at the psychology clinic upstairs, and if they need to, they can refer you somewhere else uh, to get some help. There are some things to, uh, to look for uh, for folks with uh, eating disorders. Um, obviously, their brain changes you're not going to be seeing. Uh, if you look at folks who are like excessive exercising, uh, you know, controlling the way they eat and so forth. Uh, again, this is very difficult to treat, but there are, uh, you know, therapeutic approaches that can help. All right, questions?